Good morning, all. It's good to be back with you again and uh, continuing our series on life goals. Okay, as、well, Josh said, we have a lot to cover, so I'm just going to get straight into it. No introduction or anything, okay? <laughs> You're probably familiar with this series that we've been doing.、Uh, many of you have been following along in your D groups with it, with the workbooks. And、um, it really is an engaged material、uh, put together by CCF so that we can take、um, you know, some kind of a Bible study to our friends and relatives who may not know the Lord and engage them on subjects that might be interesting to them. Obviously, with the ultimate goal of sharing the gospel with them. That's always our goal. That's always why we do what we do. But、um, sometimes you have to you know, engage people first, don't you? And get into a conversation with them. And these subjects are, of course, on everybody's heart. They're things that people are concerned about. And success is one of these major themes today that everybody is interested in. However, our definition of success at CCF is a little different, isn't it? Than the world's. As far as we're concerned, true success is becoming all that God wants you to be and doing all that He wants you to do and hearing Him say, Well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your master. Ultimately, true success in this world is about achieving what God wants you to do and being faithful in that purpose, becoming a faithful follower of Jesus Christ, putting Him on display for the world, and carrying out whatever ministry God has designed you for. Gifted you for and called you to. And that really is our goal. We define success very differently than the world does. Some of the greatest men that ever lived were poor. Did you realize that? When you think of、uh, some of the people like Jesus himself and the apostles, Jesus said the greatest man who ever lived up until him was John the Baptist. And John the Baptist lived in the desert places and ate locusts for dinner, okay? He was not a wealthy man. And ultimately, you cannot define success in God's eyes by the amount of money you have in the bank, all right? Success, as far as God is concerned, is defined by how much treasure you have stored up in heaven. And that's very, very different. So, that doesn't mean to say that God doesn't have rich servants. Abraham and Job, for instance, were, were two of the wealthiest men of their day. And God blessed them incredibly with finance. Some God will give many riches to, some He will give few riches to. Ultimately, that is up to Him to decide. He is sovereign, He makes those decisions Himself. Our responsibility is to be faithful in being a good steward of what He has entrusted into our care. That's our responsibility. So, success, as far as the Christian is concerned, is a little different. To how the world sees it. Today we're looking at succeeding in finances. And I think you'll all agree that this is a topic of some concern to pretty much all of us at one time or another. And to some people, it's a continual topic of concern、uh, where they really live every day,、uh, really with debt looming over them and really not knowing where, they're going, where the next money is going to come from to pay their bills. So, how we handle money is important. But it's also important because it has a huge effect on our spiritual lives and our fruitfulness as Christians. Obviously, if we don't handle money well, why would God entrust other things into our hands more valuable? Have you ever, many of you at CCF are attempting to build your own discipleship groups. We encourage everyone to go out and reach out to other people and to share the gospel with them and then train them in godliness. To pass on the truths that we have learned. However, why would God entrust a human life into your hands if you can't even be faithful with your money? Have you ever thought about that? It is important. Money and how we handle it is a big issue and it can have a big effect on the fruitfulness of our lives. There are over 2,300 verses in the Bible that talk about money. That's four times more than there are on prayer. And four times more than there are on faith. So the Bible has a lot to say about money. Now it's going to seem this morning like I'm giving you all of those 2,300. I'm really not, I'm only giving you a few. But I do want you to be aware that the Bible is filled with information about how to handle your finances. And it's up to you really to go back and read your Bible and study it for yourself and educate yourself about what the Bible says about these things. I can only point you in the right direction.
So hopefully you've had a good cup of coffee, you've had a good breakfast, your pen is ready to write, and you can jot down all these many references that I'm going to give you this morning so that you can go back later and think about them. But the, ultimately what we're looking at this morning is the fact that money is an important part of life, but it's also important as to how we handle it, what we do with it is a big part of our testimony. So, first thing I want to tell you is God recognizes the need for money. Okay? God's not blind. It's not a revelation to Him when you sit down in the morning and say, Lord, I don't know how to cover these bills. That's no revelation to God. God knew already. He's omniscient. He knows everything. Okay? He knows that we need money in order to live. And God recognizes that need. Secondly, God requires a certain attitude towards money. There's a certain attitude that God wants us to have. He doesn't want us to live lives that pursue it, for instance. And He doesn't want us to make money our new God. God is a jealous God. He wants you to worship Him and follow Him, not money. Yet many people in the world today base most of their decisions in life on the pursuit of wealth and riches, don't they? And uh, this is a very sad thing when people do that because it leads, as the Bible says, ultimately to ruin and will destroy you. And God reveals principles in the Word of God that govern the use of money. And that's why it's important that we educate ourselves on these principles. Sometimes God gives laws, sometimes He gives principles, sometimes He gives commands. And I'm going to try and make the differentiation as we go through this morning. Uh, we're going to refer a lot to Proverbs. Proverbs is not a list of promises. Proverbs is a list of wise sayings. Okay, and it's important to understand that. That means it's not a guarantee that if you follow all of those verses that you're going to become a wealthy person. That's not a guarantee. It's not a foregone conclusion because you have to factor in the will of God for your life as well. And sometimes it's God's will for people not to be rich. Other times it's his will for them to have a lot. You think of Solomon. God allowed Solomon to amass incredible wealth. On the other hand, you think of poor old John the Baptist or Jeremiah or somebody like that who actually owned very little. The apostles of Jesus Christ were all poor, every single one of them. They had food to eat, clothing to wear, and they traveled from place to place. They didn't even own houses as far as we know. People used to put them up as they traveled around. But then neither did Jesus, did he? Foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man doesn't have anywhere to lay his head. Right? So, you're not alone if you're struggling with money. Jesus did too. Okay? So did the apostles. They lived without great wealth as well. So, it's possible to have an effective life and not be wealthy. That's good to know, isn't it? It's also possible to be wealthy and use that wealth for God's glory. Either way, whatever it is God has in store for you, whatever His will may be for your life, it's important that you learn how to handle that money well. Now, the idea of a large middle class is relatively new, okay? It's a Western phenomenon, which has taken place since the Reformation primarily, in, um, so certainly in the United Kingdom and then on into America. But traditionally, in Jesus' day, a small number of wealthy people would own most of the land and the resources, and the rest would live basically hand-to-mouth, as we would say, on a day-to-day -day basis. And that really was the way that people lived in the Bible times. Ultimately, you would rent a piece of land from a landowner. You would work that land. You would give most of the produce back to the owner of the land. And you would get to keep enough for you to eat and possibly a little bit extra on the side if your landowner was a generous man. Even in my country, the United Kingdom, it was like that up until recent times where you had landowners and the people who worked the land for them. And that was how people lived. But one thing has not changed since the time of Jesus. People still experience a great deal of anxiety over money. And it really does cause a lot of problems for people. Now, I made a mistake I need to own up to in the first service. Who's this guy on the front of that note? Benjamin Franklin. 
Now, being an Englishman, I said he was a president, and I was rebuked for that afterwards. He's not a president. He was a statesman who drew up, helped draw up the Constitution, I'm told. So I apologize. Uh, well, our American friends are not here to us. They were very nice about it, don't worry. But uh, <laughs> I didn't, I, they, they said, we forgive you. I said, for getting it wrong or for not being an American? I don't know. I, I was trying to figure it out. But either way, Benjamin Franklin is the guy whose face is on the front of this bill. And he is well known for saying that money has never made man happy, nor will it. There is nothing in its nature to produce happiness. The more of it one has, the more one wants. Notice that money is amoral. All right? It is not immoral. It doesn't have a morality. It is amoral. There is no morality attached to money. Money is good or bad depending on how a person uses it. Or if you use it for God's glory, it becomes a good thing. If you use it for your own selfish desires, it becomes a bad thing. Ultimately, how you use the money will determine upon whether it is a good or a bad thing. And that's important to consider because money causes a lot of problems. Okay? Materialism. The love of things. All right? I was, I was told, actually, an um, interesting thing years ago, that I should hold my wife's hand when we go shopping. And not for romantic reasons, but if I'm holding her hand, she's incapable of going somewhere else to spend my money. That's what I was told years ago. So it's a good practice, men. Hold on to your wife's hand tight. Don't let her go. And uh, she can't go out there and spend it all for you. But, I mean, people like to buy, right? And it's not just women. I remember a Bible school lecturer of mine who loved shoes. And uh, you would see him with a new pair of shoes all the time, and he confessed to us one day he had such a weakness for shoes. And that's in unbelievable to me, because I wear mine until they have holes in them, literally. It, it just doesn't interest me at all. But uh, honestly, people do get very materialistic, don't they? For some people, it's cars. For other people, it's watches. For other people, it's the new cell phone. And people have to have things. And materialism can cause a lot of problems in your life. You end up paying for things for a much longer period of time than you thought, and it, it really it binds you up and renders you incapable of maybe doing things the Lord wants you to do because you're trying to pay off something else. So materialism can be a problem. We have a rule in my family. Well, my wife's not here. She's gone with her mother. But uh, my, my rule with my wife in our family is you know, she, loves, she has a weakness for handbags and shoes. She loves those two things. But if she gets a new one, or if anybody gives her a new one, she has to give one away. That's the rule we have in our family. She's not allowed to accumulate clothing and shoes and things she doesn't wear. And why do I do that? Because we are stewards of what we have. And my wife's okay with that because she still gets new things. She just means she has to say goodbye to an old one. And that somebody else is normally very grateful for. Normally for me, if I end up getting a new pair of shoes or something, I give my old ones to Windy. You might know him at the center. He's a security guard that looks after Pastor Peter when he's preaching. And he's the only guy I know at CCF who's even remotely the same size as me. So, although he's muscle and I'm fat, so. But uh, the feet are the same. And, uh, and I often give him a pair of shoes if somebody kindly gives me a pair. Or if I get a new pair for some reason, then I often pass on a pair to him. Why? Because we're stewards. Materialism is wrong. We don't want to endlessly accumulate stuff we don't use. So we have a rule in our house. If it doesn't get used in six months, it gets given away to somebody who needs it more. I can see the shocked look on some of the ladies' faces. You know? <laughs> but honestly, we do. You think about it, ladies. You think about how many things you have in your closet that you've not used in years. Okay? It's important to think about. But somebody else who is poor could make good use of that, right? So why not bless them today and give them something? Debt. Debt's a terrible problem. People spending money they don't have. Dishonesty in business in particular is such a problem today, isn't it? You're either being cheated or you're the one doing the cheating. And, and it's so difficult today to, to live ethically. Corruption. It, it goes from the top of society to the bottom of society. All because people love money more than they love God. Marriage conflicts. So many problems in marriage. People fighting over money. Suicide. One of the biggest reasons for suicide is financial because people haven't got what they want or because they've lost what they had. It's interesting to me that some of the biggest debtors in the world earn the most money. 
When you think about Hollywood stars, you often see uh, Brad Pitt's mansion goes up on the marketplace and sort of all over Facebook. He's selling it for so many millions of, of dollars. Why? Well, I don't know his reasons for it, but oftentimes they sell off things like that when they're not making as much as they were making before. When they were the flavor of the month, they were making millions and millions and millions. But obviously, there's a time limit on these things. New actors come along, old ones are not as popular as they used to be, and therefore they have to start liquidating assets to maintain the lifestyle. They just can't do it anymore. So we need to think about these things. Money can cause a lot of problems. And that's why Paul, when speaking to the young pastor Timothy, as he was pastoring the congregation at Ephesus in particular, he said, if we have food and covering with these, we shall be content. What does that mean? Food and covering was the basic necessities of life. And Paul says, if we have those things, we're content. Now, in modern society, it might be a little difficult to live with just food and covering. Uh, your boss might fire you for not texting him back. You know, uh, Sometimes it, it can get hard. We need a cell phone in, in this society and things like that. So I'm not saying we go back to the, to the time of the apostles and live that way. But what I am saying is there are basic necessities and then there are wants, right? And with the basic necessities of life, we should be content if we love the Lord. And we trust him to give us what he wants us to have. Paul goes on to say, But those who want to get rich fall into temptation, and a snare, and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil, and some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. What's Paul's advice to this young pastor? Flee from these things, you man of God. And instead, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. These things are more important. It's reminiscent of what Jesus said in the Beatitudes, isn't it? Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things, all the daily needs, will be added unto you. That's the promise that God's given to us. If we seek Him first, if we love Him and walk with Him as He has called us to, then He will take care of the daily needs that we have. It's not a promise to take care of our daily wants, okay, but our daily needs. And that's an important thing to understand. So this morning we're going to cover three basic um, headings. Firstly, the right perspective. Secondly, the right practices. And then thirdly, the right price. As we consider this issue of finances and how we should really flee this desire to be rich, and yet at the same time be a good steward of what God has placed into our care. So firstly, the right perspective. God owns all wealth. Do you realize that? He owns it all. He owns every single penny of it. The Bible says, The earth is the Lord's and all it contains, the world and those who dwell in it. God owns everything. It says, for every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird of the mountains, and everything that moves in the field is mine. God says, if I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine, and all it contains. I love this one in Haggai. Haggai the prophet is talking about the nations of the world, and he says, the silver is mine, and the gold is mine declares the Lord of hosts. God owns all wealth. There is no wealth out there that God does not own. There is no money that doesn't belong to Him. There is no produce. There is no land. He owns it all. But secondly, God gives man the power to make wealth. Okay? Not to make him rich, necessarily, but God gives him the power to work and earn a living, right? Right? God has given him the ability to do that. It says in Deuteronomy 8.18, 8, But you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who is giving you power to make wealth, that he may confirm his covenant which he swore to your fathers as it is to this day. Now, a lot of people will quote that, but they will neglect to remind people that while God made those promises to Israel, he also warned them what would happen if they didn't follow him, right? He also warned them about cursing and about losing that wealth to invading nations if they didn't walk with him and put him first. 
And it's interesting because in the New Testament, we have similar kind of promise. It says in Philippians 4.19, My God will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. I won't ask how many of you have that on your fridge at home. Or how many of you have a t-shirt with that on. Or maybe a little bookmark in your Bible to remind you during times of hardship. It's a verse we cherish. But notice the verse number. It's verse 19. There's an 18. Okay? And the 18 is very important in understanding the 19. That's why we need to read the Bible really in the order that it is written. Because it says in 18, I have received everything in full and have an abundance. I am amply supplied, having received from Epaphroditus what you sent, a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. What's Paul saying? Paul is saying, you have done well with your finances. You've handled your finances in a way that is honoring to God. And because of that, my God will supply all your needs. You ever notice that? That's why we're always telling you with Bible study, it's context. If you come on Tuesday nights, you'll learn this. Context. Context. Otherwise, you can make the Bible say whatever you want it to say. If you don't put the verses in their context. That doesn't change the fact that this is a wonderful promise. But there is a condition attached to it. Don't expect God to honor you in your finances if you don't honor Him. Why would you expect that? It's just not the way it works. And if you want your finances to be all that God wants them to be, and again, I'm not telling you God's going to make you rich. That would be a lie. Okay? Maybe he will, maybe he won't. That's up to him. Okay? But I want you to understand that your finances will never be what they could be until you recognize that God owns all of it and that you are a steward of it. And that's why it's so important to understand the context of these promises. But it is a beautiful promise. In this verse, Paul points out three things. Firstly, the fragrant aroma. The gift they give was given with the right motive. They loved him. They loved Paul very much. And they loved God very much. So the Philippians sent Paul a sacrificial gift. They themselves were in hardship. We know this because elsewhere in the New Testament, it tells us that the churches of Macedonia were dirt poor. And they had very little money. Yet somehow they had scraped together a sacrificial gift to send to Paul to meet his needs. They had right motives. Not only that, but it's an acceptable sacrifice. It contained the right content. Exactly what God wanted them to give. And it is pleasing to God. They gave it the right way. Cheerfully and out of love and willingly given to God for the needs of Paul. I remember a nervous moment years ago when I was uh, first becoming a missionary. And um, this was going back now, it was 1992 I think it was. I had just finished high school and I was going straight from high school to Bible school. And the elders of the church wanted to meet with me and I knew why. Because they were commending me to missionary service and missionary training. And they wanted to know what I expected from them with regard to uh, how they were going to take care of me on the mission field. So I went into a meeting with them. I sat down with four very stern looking men. And they looked at me, and I'm just a kid. I mean, I'm very young. I started very young as a missionary. And uh, I'm there kind of looking at them, very nervous. And they were kind of like said, what do you expect from us? And I'm like racking my brain. I, I've been really praying hard, asking the Lord to give me the right words. And I said to them, God gave me a really wise answer. It must have come from him because it would never come from me. But uh, I, said, I said, I don't want a penny more than God asked you to give. And I don't want a penny less. <laughs> and they just smiled. They thought that was quite an interesting answer for them. But that's the reality, right? You want what God wants you to give. And you want what God has told you to put aside. And as a church, when you have many responsibilities and many people to look after, that was the answer that God gave me for them. And till this day, after 21, oh, 21 years on the mission field and four or five years in training... So almost, well, over a quarter of a century now, they have faithfully supported me every month. Okay? They're just a tiny church. It's not a huge amount of money. But they faithfully send to me every single month. And then, of course, when I got married... 
to my wife as well. So that's from the UK. That's to support me, to keep me here. CCF doesn't pay me. I'm a missionary. I live by faith. So I have sponsorship churches in the UK who actually keep me here. And uh, as a result of that, and their faithfulness over what? Almost quarter of a century. You know, I'm still here. And hopefully for many years to come, by God's grace. But you need to understand, this is important, isn't it? When we start claiming promises that God has made, we need to understand them in their context. And we need to recognize that this is His money. He owns it all. And ultimately, He gives man the power to make a living. God promises to meet the needs of those who truly love Him. Again, Jesus in Luke 12, Do not seek what you will eat and what you will drink, and do not keep worrying about it all the time. Okay, Filipinos have a habit of this, worrying all the time about money. And do you see it in D groups all the time? Whenever the prayer requests come up, it's always money, 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 money. Yeah, everybody needs money. That's life, right? Pretty much everybody needs it. But this is the promise that God has made to you. For all these things the nations of the world eagerly seek, but your Father knows that you need these things. He knows already. He knows that you need them. So what's His advice? You're in a relationship with God. You claim to love Him. You claim to make, put Him first. So Jesus' advice is seek His kingdom. And these things, what, what are these things? Your daily needs will be added to you. Matthew adds in another factor. Seek first His kingdom and His righteousness. And these things will be added to you. So, what's God's commitment to you? God's commitment to you is to meet your daily needs. What's your commitment to God? To put Him first in all things. Not just money, but everything. To seek Him first. So let's look at a couple of principles that God has established. The first one is work. It's God's will that His people work and that they receive a return for their labor. It says in Proverbs 14, In all labor there is profit, but mere talk leads only to poverty. You see these guys around, don't you? I often meet, meet up with them sometimes in Starbucks, uh, just chatting with people in general. You know, they're all talk. There's nothing but hot air. But you never actually see them do anything. And then, of course, they're the ones that come along the rest of their friends, and they're always asking for a handout, right? They're the ones who don't actually work hard. But they've got lots of ideas. They talk up a storm of talk. But they don't work. They don't actually do anything. I want you to understand something this morning. God hates laziness. He hates it. He despises it. And He expects His people to work. This is so important. It says in Proverbs, Go to the ant, O sluggard. I love that, that old sort of English word for laziness. You slug, you, you unwilling to move person, you know. Observe her ways. This is the ant. And be wise, having, which having no chief officer or ruler. In other words, no one there with a whip forcing her to work. She just works on her own, prepares her food in the summer, gathers her provision in the harvest. How long will you lie down, O sluggard? When will you arise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. Your poverty will come in like a vagabond and your need like an armed man. In other words, it'll appear suddenly and it's going to hurt. Okay? God hates laziness. He always has. God is more serious about laziness than you think. Can I show you a command that the apostles gave the early church? It's going to shock some of you, especially in this culture. For when, even when we were with you, we used to give you this order. If anyone is not willing to work, then he is not to eat either. Now when I first came to the Philippines, I lived in a province and, and I was kind of introduced. So I, I, got, I was up close and personal with a lot of families. In Manila, you tend to be more distant from people. You, you see them at church and stuff. But in the province, you tend to be in their house. You tend to get to know them a lot better. And I was shocked at the number of layabouts in the house. It really shocked me. Because if it was my brother who just bummed around in the house all day and asked for money, I would tell him no and kick his butt out the door and make him go get a job. Okay? I mean, he wouldn't get anything from me. And he shouldn't get anything from you. 
If he is not willing to work, Paul says, don't feed him. Don't feed him. Boy, that's hard for Filipinos to hear, right? But that's how seriously God takes laziness. Honestly, I don't give money to relatives who aren't willing to go out and try their best to get a job. But if my brother is working hard and he has a need that he can't meet, of sure, of course, I'll help him. But if he's just going to sit around and watch TV and drink alcohol all day, he will not get one penny from me. Nothing. Why? Because the money that I have belongs to God. And God doesn't want it used for that purpose. I can see some horrified looks on people's faces. This is God's word, okay? It's God's word. The early church lived in communities. They had very sparse resources. They weren't wealthy people. Many of them were slaves. And the rule was simple. If you're going to live here with us, you work. And if you don't work, you don't eat. Wow. I'll let you chew on that for a while over lunch. Principle number two, save. It's God's will we handle the money he entrusts us with carefully. There is precious treasure and oil in the dwelling of the wise, the writer of Proverbs says. But a foolish man swallows it up. Shall I put that into modern Filipino terminology? I think you have a word called libre, right? No blowout. Okay? Now, there's nothing wrong with treating your friends, okay? There's nothing wrong with that. We all treat our friends from time to time. But if God brings a large sum your way and you are really normally struggling financially from week to week, the last thing you want to do is just blow it all. You shouldn't do that. Why? Because it's God's money and you need to take care of it. So what does the writer of Proverbs, what does Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, say? There is precious treasure and oil in the dwelling of the wise. The wise person puts it aside and keeps some just in case there's none tomorrow. And this is important. Don't abuse what God has given you and then go crying to Him when suddenly you fall ill the next week and can't pay your medical bill. He may have already provided it and you may have wasted it. So these are things we have to think about. I'm not saying that we live life fearfully and we, and we don't ever enjoy life. What I'm saying is you're a steward of what you have. And you're accountable for what you have to God who owns everything. And how you use it, it's important that you use it in a way that pleases Him. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. Not just his children, but his grandchildren. That's a good man. A man who worked hard his whole life. He tries to leave a little something. Not just for his kids, but even for his grandkids. And the wealth of the sinner is stored up for the righteous. That's a difficult verse to interpret. But what it simply means is this. Even though the sinner may look like he's getting away with everything, and the sinner may look like he is very, very wealthy and prosperous, ultimately the righteous will inherit all his wealth. And that's true. Because when Jesus comes and sets up his kingdom, we, the righteous, will inherit the earth with Christ. And we will... Basically, all the wealth of the world will go to him. And we, Romans 8 says, 8, 17, we are heirs of God and co-heirs of Christ Jesus. We will inherit with him. So ultimately, we will all inherit. There is coming a time when there will be no more monetary need. But for now, we still live in this world. And for now, sinners run this world. And that makes it a difficult place to live. So we need to save. We need to always operate with a margin. Don't be presumptuous upon God. It said, David used to say, Keep back your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, and I shall be acquitted of great transgression. It's a horrible thing to presume upon the goodness of God and the grace of God. Now, I'm a missionary. I live by faith, but I don't take God for granted. Every month, you know, our support will come in. Some months it may be small, some months it may be big. But whatever it is, I never take God for granted. I always look to Him and I'm always grateful for what He has given. Always thankful. Always trying to use it the way He tells me to use it. Sometimes people send us large gifts from the UK and you open you'd like your email and you go, wow, that's a lot of money. Is, is that all for us? And then you see a note 
this is for children in Mindanao. And you're like, oh, okay, Lord, that's fine, no problem. And you make sure that 100% of that money goes to children in Mindanao. Other times, they've sent us money for all sorts of different reasons. Sometimes it was for struggling pastors in the Philippines. So we, we went on a hunt to try and find some pastors who were struggling financially, and we made sure that 100% of that money went to those pastors. It's important. We have an account where, with a sum of money in it that sat there because it's earmarked for a special purpose. And to this day, that purpose hasn't come to pass. And that money has been sat there for 10 years because that money was given specifically for a very specific reason. And that money is there waiting because that time will come. It's inevitable. It's just it hasn't happened to us yet. But when that time comes, that money can be accessed and used. It's God's money. It's not mine. And when God brings it to me, especially if he has some note to attach to it, then I use it for his purpose, right? I don't presume upon the grace of God. I don't make choices that waste his resources. That was what Satan tempted Jesus to do. He said, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you. And on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, on the other hand, you should interpret the scriptures correctly, Jesus said. <laughs> Basically, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Uh, you know, look at the context, Satan. That's the truth of it, isn't it? Don't test God. Don't have a massive blowout and buy yourself an expensive car and then come running to God because you can't pay your, your medical bills. That just, that's not how it works. You need to be responsible. It is a foolish sin to foolishly waste the resources God gives you and then expect him to rescue you when your creditors come calling. The Western way. Don't follow the Western way. Many Filipinos are, sadly. But when they offer you these credit cards in the mall, say no. Okay? Don't just endlessly pick up new credit cards. In the Philippines, they're really good at giving out credit cards. You ever notice that? In England, they, they're kind of not so quick to do that. They, they're more careful. But, but here, they're like, everybody wants you to have one of theirs. You say, well, I'm already with HSBC. Oh, no, we've we got a BDO one here right for you. You know, and I mean, you can literally have five or six in your, in your wallet if you want it. But what's the Western way? Buy things you do not need with money you do not have, borrowed from people you do not like. Okay, that's the Western way. They're your best friend when they're giving you that card. But you be late with your payment just once, they'll be your worst enemy. They hate you. They, they don't love you. Banks don't care about you at all. They exploit you. They may look all friendly and smile, but at the end of the day, if you're late with your payment, you will find out just how nasty they can be. Don't get into debt. Save for a rainy day. Protect your testimony. You see, debt's a real problem. Debt is an endless spiral in many ways. Uh, it occurs when your financial obligations are greater than your income. And then you start to lose things. For instance, one of the first things that goes out the window is you stop supporting your campus missionary. Why? Because you don't have extra anymore. You don't have a margin. So one of the first things that happens is those faithful servants of God that you promised to support don't get their support anymore. I don't think there is a missionary out there that served God for any length of time that at some time hasn't received a letter from someone who has gotten themselves in financial difficulty and can no longer support you. Okay, that, that, that happens. Now, that's okay. From my, when that happens to me, I just thank them for all their support in the past and I pray for them and I, and I, and I tell them, you know, well, you know, I, I just hope that you're able to solve this issue and that um, you'll walk with God and that God will bless you in the future. But I, for me, that's end of story. I don't worry about it anymore. I don't deal, try and deal with it myself. I just trust God. That's the missionary's job if you're listening campus missionaries. Your job is to trust God, not people, okay? I, I can see one back there. You trust God. You never trust people, okay? Trust God. But the problem is when people fall into debt, that's one of the first obligations that goes. You lose the ability to help others. You don't stop supporting them. The ability to support the local church, that's the next thing to go. You can't help support the local church anymore. And then the ability to meet the needs of others around you is also gone. 
And then, of course, you end up maybe losing your car. Now you can't drive anymore and your job depends on it, so you lose your job. And now, having lost your job, you can't pay your mortgage, so you lose your home. And before you know it, you've lost your testimony. And that's the most important thing of all. What kind of a Christian witness do you have if your, if your non-Christian friends see you always in debt? You see, a lot of Christians don't understand this. It's better to lower your standard of living than to continually be asking people for money. Honestly, it's much better to do that. Why? Because what kind of a testimony is it to God and to people about God when you claim to be His child and He is your Father and you are always begging for money? It's a problem, isn't it? Now, I recognize that many of you probably have debts. That's the society we live in, sadly. I challenge you to look for ways to get rid of your debts. Get out of debt as soon as you can. If it means living at a lower wage level, then do that. If it means living in a different location, then do that. If it means driving a cheaper car, then do that. Do whatever you need to do to clear those debts and maintain your testimony because that's more important. Thirdly, plan. It's not your money. It belongs to God. You are a steward of it. By wisdom a house is built and by understanding it is established and by knowledge the rooms are filled with all precious and ple pleasant riches. When I first read that, I was like, I understand what it's saying, but it's, it's kind of really weird in the English. So I read a few uh, books and a few commentaries and one of the commentators suggested actually looking at this particular verse in the Living Bible. Now I'm not always, a f I'm not really a fan of, of paraphrase versions, but um, it actually in this case it does a pretty good job. I think you'll find this easier to understand. Any enterprise is built by wise planning, becomes strong through common sense and profits wonderfully by keeping abreast of the facts. In other words, planning. It's important to plan. In our family, my wife keeps the budget. She's in charge of it. I don't even want to look at it. I don't even want to see it. Normally, when, when the email comes through about our support, whatever it may be, whether it's small or large, I tell her what it is. Then we do the calculation from pounds to pesos, and we know how many times we can withdraw from the ATM before that's gone. So I say to my wife, you have three withdrawals this week. That's it. You've got to make it fit. So Jingle then balances the budget based on three withdrawals. Other times, maybe we can have four withdrawals and we get a little bit extra. So she balances it based on four. Sometimes we're able to give to other people because God gives extra. Other times, things are so tight we, we can barely make it through. But God always provides. We always have enough. And I've been doing this for 30 years, okay? God has always provided for us for 30 years as we walk with Him. But my wife keeps a plan. She knows exactly what the expenditure is, what our needs are versus our wants. And if we don't have enough for our wants, then we don't bother. I jokingly said at the main one time, you know, sometimes we tighten our belt and we don't get Skippy peanut butter. That was a mistake. I had so many jars of Skippy peanut butter, I'm still eating it. Okay? <laughs> I mean, people, Filipinos are very generous, and when they hear stories like that, they often want to help. And I praise God for that. But please, I don't need any more peanut butter. I'm, I'm good, all right? I'm fat enough already. But, uh, but I mean, there are times when as missionaries, you know, we cross something off the list. You know, like I like real cheese, but sometimes you can only afford cheese whiz. So that's okay. We have cheese whiz. Praise God. I'm happy with cheese whiz. I like cheese whiz. But the bottom line is, is that, you know, that's how we function. We don't maintain the same living standard when the income is lower. When the income is lower, we lower our standard to meet what we have. And we try and always have a margin so that we can help other people who have needs as well. Yes, as missionaries, we are also givers. We give. We give a lot more than 10% sometimes as missionaries. Just because we're living by faith doesn't mean we don't give. We give. And God always looks after us. He always has. He always will. He has never failed to meet our needs. Our wants, that's a different story, but sometimes He gives us those as well. He's a good God. But he expects you to walk with him and he expects you to plan. Mismanaging God's money can lead to debt. 
Debt leads to slavery. That's why Romans says, Owe no nothing to anyone. That's a command, folks. Owe nothing to anyone except a debt of love. It's beautiful, isn't it? A debt of love. That's all you should owe anybody. You might say, well, what about our house? Well, the house is a little bit different. Most Christians agree that it's okay to have a mortgage because ultimately you have an asset, okay? And the asset offsets the debt. So should you fail or default on your payments, then, then they just take the house and you don't owe anything. So you have an asset in play. It's a little bit different when you have an asset in play. But we're talking now about just basically spending money you don't have and racking up debt with people when you could actually simply lower your living standard a little bit. Drink, drink you know, coffee from McDonald's instead of Starbucks. You'll what, save how many pesos by doing that? Quite a lot. It's amazing what you can save if you look around. The rich rules over the poor and the borrower becomes the lender's slave. Do you see that? You become a slave. And if you become a slave, you're unable to function freely. So when opportunities to serve God come up, you're not able to participate. When a retreat comes up and you really want to go, you don't have the money. Praise God, we sponsor people like that, so please don't not go. All right, uh, we will help you if you really want to go. But really, I mean, if you kept a margin, then you would be able to pay, right? So it's important to think about this. Slavery leads to a lack of freedom to serve God. It says in 1 Corinthians 7, 23, you were bought with a price. Do not become the slaves of men. It's an interesting passage because many that were saved were already slaves. But some of them were able to get out of it. And Paul is saying, if you're able to get out of it, good. If you can't, that's not your fault. So you live for God as a slave. But don't become a slave. If you become a slave, then you no longer have the freedom to serve God the way that you did before. That's why 2 Corinthians 9.8 says, And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. Work on a margin. Save. Keep a budget so that you handle your finances well. So then the, the inevitable question is, why do I always have problems? Maybe some of you are already doing that. Maybe you, some of you already work hard, you save, and you have a budget, but you're still struggling financially. Well, there's some other things to consider. Firstly, do you need it? Do you really need more, or are you simply living above your means? That's one thing to think about. Is this a time of testing? Do you remember Job? Job went through a time where all his wealth was taken away for a long time. That didn't happen over a weekend, folks. What happened to Job probably took place over years. Job lost everything. No, God vindicated him in the end, but he still went through a terrible time of testing, didn't he? Not because he was in sin, but because God wanted to grow him in righteousness. On the other hand, maybe it's a time of chastening. Maybe there is some sin in your life that hasn't been dealt with and God is trying to get your attention. So he gives you financial problems. Nothing gets our attention better than that, right? If God wants to get your attention, taking away your money is a good way to do it. And he does do that. Sometimes he takes away your money, sometimes he takes away your health. But he does things to get your attention when you're not walking with him. Did you misuse what God already entrusted you with? Do you need to cut to get down on your knees and ask his forgiveness for this? Have you been a wasteful person? Have you violated God's word? Now, God's word has a lot to say about money, as I told you. I'm just going to give you a few one after the other, okay? I'm not going to spend time on them. I'm just going to give you them bang, 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 one after the other. I just want you to know that there is a lot of information out there. Just reading the book of Proverbs through once a month would help you, okay? Deal with your finances. It says, there is one who scatters and yet increases all the more. And there is one who withholds what is justly due. And yet it results only in want. Withholding money from those to whom it is due. Are you stingy? What is the word you use here? Kuripot? Are you kuripot? Is that how you say it? Oh, without the aspiration, Filipinos, right? Are you unfair? Does your helper get a fair wage? Is your helper looked after well? Do you pay her benefits like you're meant to by law here in the Philippines? Do you look after your helper properly? You know, we pay our helper a fair wage. 
We make sure that all her benefits are done. And my wife's not here, so I can say this. When she has a day off, I often slip her something extra as well. So she can have some fun. She works hard. She serves us hard. I want her to have the same fun that I would have if I was going to have a day off. It's important, folks. Are you stingy? Do you hold out on others? Do you not pay people what they're due? Then why on earth would you expect God to look to meet your needs? Honestly, as they say, what goes around comes around. If you're going to live a stingy life, then maybe God will give you a dose of your own medicine. The plans of the diligent lead surely to advantage. But everyone who is hasty comes surely to poverty. Are you impatient? Are you one of these people that just can't wait? So you jump into things and you make mistakes and you make bad choices and you end up in trouble. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man is he who listens to counsel. Are you stubborn? You know, your parents have come along and they've warned you. They have years of experience in business. They know what they're talking about. And they come alongside and they tell you, son, daughter, you can't do it like that. But you just don't listen. Well, you reap what you sow. Are you stubborn? Do not love sleep or you will become poor. Now, who doesn't love sleep? We all love sleep, right? Everyone loves a good night's sleep. But what's it talking about here? Don't be lazy. Work hard. It's a biblical principle. For the heavy drinker and the glutton will come to poverty, and drowsiness will clothe one with rags. What's it talking about here? Again, the sleep thing, but also, are you wasteful? Are you indulgent? Maybe you don't need that extra rice with every meal. Okay? I certainly don't. Maybe you could do with losing a couple of pounds here and there and save a little bit of money as well. He who tills his land will have plenty of food, but he who follows empty pursuits will have poverty in plenty. What does this mean? Are you shady? Are you a risk taker? Are you one of these person, people who always likes to get into crafty schemes, get rich quick ideas? Is that what you like? You know what? At the end of the day, they say people like that end up poor. But you know what they do say? Professional businessmen tell us this. These con men, who normally end up poor in the end, actually would be incredibly successful if they got into real business because they're clever men. That's what they say. They would actually be very successful if they worked hard. But they're not willing to work hard. They're too lazy for that. They want a get-rich-quick scheme. And before you know it, your savings are gone. So those are, the, those are the perspectives that we should have on money. What about the practices then? Aside from many principles, we also find practices in the scripture. The first is prayer. Financial decisions are spiritual decisions. When you recognize that God expects you to handle his money well. Remember, God owns all that money. You have been entrusted with it. And you are expected to use it for his glory. And if you're not doing that, then that's a problem in your spiritual life. Therefore, when you spend money, it becomes a spiritual decision. My wife and I have often prayed for long periods of time before we spent money, just to be sure, because we just didn't have peace about spending it on certain things. So it's important to pray without ceasing. The Bible says, pray about everything. What a friend we have in Jesus. Remember that song? Take it to the Lord in prayer, everything, even your financial decisions. Faithfulness is important. The Bible teaches us that we're accountable to God and must glorify Him in every area of our lives, including how we use His money. Whether then you eat or drink, those are the normal uh, basic necessities of life. Or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Everything. As I've often told the GLC students, you can eat an ice cream for the glory of God. Did you know that? You can do that. But you also need to handle your finances in a way that glorifies God as well. It says in 1 Corinthians 4.2, In this case, moreover, it is required of stewards that one be found trustworthy. Contextually, it's talking about the mysteries of God. But ultimately, the mysteries of God is the Word of God. And the Word of God mustn't just be in your head. It must also be lived out in your life. Therefore, you are a steward of the Word of God, not just in what you know, but in what you 
do. It's not good enough knowing principles about money. You need to live principles about money. Providing is important. There's a strict command in the New Testament to provide for your family's needs. If anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Are you listening, men? As the leaders of your household, it doesn't say you have to make your family rich. It doesn't say that you have to provide enough so that your children can go to the most expensive schools. It doesn't say that. What it says is you have to provide for them. You have to meet their needs. And God expects every household leader to do that. Important. Clearing debt. We're told that it is wrong to owe people money, so a top priority is getting out of debt, right? Owe nothing to anyone. And along with that, it was mentioned to me on the way out, um, very apologetically, because this is a long message, but he said, could you add this in? He said, a big problem in this culture is borrowing and lending. Okay? Do you know the practice that we practice as pastors at CCF? We don't loan anybody anything. We just give. Whatever we have, whatever we can spare, whatever we have in our margin, if you like, that God would have us to give, we give. But we don't loan anything. And that's a good practice because this whole issue of loaning people things with the expectation you're going to get it back in this culture is called being naive. Honestly, most people never pay back what you loan them, do they? That just doesn't happen. Many of you have outstanding debts, right? And outstanding debtors, people who owe you money. But you'll probably never see that money again, will you? So a good rule to work on is it's God's money. Give them what you believe God would have you to give them. But don't loan them money. Make it a gift and trust God. It's a good practice. That way, you don't ruin the relationship with the person. I often say to people, I, I used to, before I could understand much Tagalog, I used to say to people in Baliwag, when I gave them something, I used to say, Walang uh, utang. No, you don't owe me anything. This is from God. Take it as a gift from God. Now, sometimes that means you can't meet the whole amount. That's okay. Let God worry about the rest. Okay? And let them work for the rest. But ultimately, lending, not a good idea. Really not. Because the chances of getting it back is very slim. And then what happens? There's a break in the relationship, isn't there? Because when that person can't pay you back, you get angry. It's better not to put yourself in that situation if it can be helped. Okay? So when people come to me, if I can give, I give. But I never loan. Unless it's a book or something. I expect my books back, guys. <laughs> giving. Giving is greatly encouraged in the scriptures. It's not God's way of raising money. It is God's way of raising children. Did you think about that before? God doesn't need your money. He owns everything. So why does he want us to give? He wants us to give because it's important for us. We grow in our faith as we give to others. As we take care of their needs. And as we trust God to meet ours, we grow. On the first day of every week, each one of you is to put aside and save as he may prosper so that no collections be made when I come. When I arrive, whomever you may approve, I will send them with letters to carry your gift to Jerusalem. This was Paul writing to the Corinthians. And there was a need that was, that was in Jerusalem. The Jerusalem believers were very poor. And Paul said, okay, I'm going to take a collection to meet that need. So I want you guys to set aside a little bit of money. And then when I come, I'll collect it. And I'll go with whomever you choose and we'll take it to Jerusalem. And we'll give it to those people and we'll meet that need. It's important. Giving is important. And we see it happening often in the New Testament from people who couldn't afford really to give. They gave sacrificially. Every time you give sacrificially, you give a little of your selfishness away. I thought that was nice. Each one must do just as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. You can get it from me later, Joe. don't worry. 
<laughs> God loves a cheerful giver. He wants us to give cheerfully. He wants us to give willingly. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. So in other words, when you give properly and you're handling your finances well, God can give you even extra so that you are capable and able to help others and perform good deeds that please Him. There's a theology of giving. I don't really have time to go through it, so I'm just going to mention the points to you. But in Philippians chapter 4, uh, Paul actually lays out a number of principles for us. Firstly, it should be done from genuine concern. Secondly, it should be done as God gives opportunity. Obviously, according to the providence of God, there may be a time when you're unable to give. My wife and I have experienced times like that. Um, they don't come too often, but occasionally there'll be a time where really, honestly, you just don't have anything to spare. There's nothing. Everything is allocated out. It's all gone and you're left with nothing to spare. But other times God puts extra in your possession and brings somebody across your path with a need and then he expects you to meet it. And that's really something that should be done. Paul recognized that the Philippians wanted to send him a gift before but they were so desperately poor they just couldn't do it. And Paul says that's okay. That's up to God. God is the one who takes care of those things. But he said now he rejoiced that they were now able to send a gift because God had prospered them and given them more than they had before. It should be for those that serve God. There's nothing wrong with giving a meal to a child on the street. There's nothing wrong with helping out a neighbor who is struggling. But ultimately it's God's money and God has given it to you and especially to the wealthier among us to help out his people who don't have quite so much. That's important. It should be consistent giving. It should be generous giving. It should be an act of worship. And ultimately it's an act of faith. You give believing God that he will meet your needs as well in his own time and in his own way. Another important principle, God doesn't just look at what we give, he also sees what we keep. He also looks at that too. There's a beautiful hymn written years ago called Just As I Am. Some of you will be familiar with it. Just as I am without one plea that that, but that thy blood was shed for me and that thou bidst me come to thee. O Lamb of God, I come, I come. It was often played at the um, altar call of um, services in the United States in particular many years ago. And uh, many people were greatly touched by this song, but few people know the story behind it or the story of Charlotte Elliott. Charlotte Elliott was an invalid. She was a beautiful young woman apparently, but she had terrible health issues and she was bedridden. And she could barely get out of bed most days. Sometimes she would just sit in a chair at her table. But she just couldn't do much. And she was a very bitter, angry young woman. Until a preacher came along and got in her face and was very direct with her and called her to repentance and she responded. And the Lord saved her wonderfully. And um, she received a, a great deal of relief, obviously, in her spirit at knowing that she was now the Lord's, but she still struggled with the idea that she didn't have much to offer God. She still struggled with the fact that she couldn't really do much. And uh, she was greatly challenged to do what she could do. And that was write songs and poems. So that's what she did, and she wrote many. Many of them are, are available today if you want to look at them. But she wrote this, this long hymn, I'm just giving you the first verse, and it was used in many ways by God over the years. In fact, I've been told, and I can't be certain about this, but I've been told that no other hymn has been translated into as many languages as this one. That's what I was told. It's interesting because a few years later, a young man called Billy walked into a meeting and heard a gospel message and heard this song being played and responded to it. And he went forward. You know him as Billy Graham. And he went forward in response to this song. He later wrote an autobiography based on the song called Just As I Am. It had such a profound impact on his life. A few years after that, there was a young man called David. And he had just uh, gone through a real nasty breakup with his girlfriend the elders of the church had come to his girlfriend who was a Christian and they told her you need to break up with David he's not a Christian now my, my 
David was, was from a family that didn't know the Lord. In fact, nobody in his family knew the Lord. And he just couldn't understand why she would break up with him. But he had a Gideon New Testament that was given to him when he was very young. So he started reading the Gideon New Testament, and guess who popped up on TV but Billy Graham. So he made a commitment to the Lord and came to know the Lord. His name's obviously David Bradford. You might recognize the last name. Okay, this is a picture of him today. He had four sons, all of whom are following the Lord, and one of them is standing in front of you now. So you might want to know what God can do with the little that you have. You think of the boy with the loaves and the fishes. It's not like Sunday school shows you. It wasn't loaves and fishes, okay? It was loaves, little flatbreads, and fishes. There are little fishes like that, which actually they used as a paste because uh, they weren't big enough to like eat as a normal fish. But Jesus took that small amount that that little boy had and multiplied it and turned it into enough to feed 5,000. And ultimately, that's 5,000 men. Experts tell us if you include the women and the children, 15,000 was probably a, more, a better estimate of the number of people who were fed that day. So that's interesting, isn't it? When you give your little bit, God can do a lot with it. It may seem small to you. But God can do an awful lot with a little. And then, of course, there's tithing. Many of God's people practice tithing. They set aside 10% of their income each month and give it to God. Now, this is a great way of managing your finances well and making sure that you do give to the Lord's work. And many Christians around the world do this. In fact, most evangelical churches would practice tithing today. Now, the important thing to think about, to remember about tithing is while this is a good practice and it is good to set aside some money for the Lord every month, don't forget that God owns far more than 10%. God owns 100% of your money or the money He's entrusted into your care. So even though you've given your 10, you still need to seek Him regarding the rest. Don't just think that's yours to blow, okay? It's not. You're still accountable for the rest of it. So whatever you practice, it's important to consider these things. Finally, the right price. The bottom line when discussing finances is who do you love and serve? No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. So you need to choose. Is God going to be your master? Or is your career and the pursuit of money going to be your master. Which is it? If you love money, you serve money. If you love God, you will serve Him. Jesus said it very plainly. If you love me, you will obey me. That's real love as far as He's concerned. The sad thing is most people in the world today would willingly lay aside their beliefs to get what they want. Most people out there have a price. And if you offer them enough, they'd be willing to turn their back on their beliefs. I had an interesting story uh, that I came across about a businessman in America who was at a meeting and he was sat beside just an absolutely beautiful woman. And he looked at her and he wanted her. So he said to her, if I offer you $100,000 right now, will you sleep with me? She said yes. She said she would. So he then asked her a second question. Would you sleep with me for $10? And she got really angry. And she said, what do you think I am? Do you know what he said? He said, we established what you are with the first question. Now we're establishing the price. You see, being willing to accept 100000 to sleep with a man, that makes you a prostitute. $10 doesn't change that you're still willing to sell out your faith for money. So that's something to think about, isn't it? Because oftentimes in the minds of Christians, as with their desperately deceitful and wicked hearts, as Jeremiah says, they will justify something because it's a lot. It's a lot of money. Okay, I can just do it and then ask for forgiveness. God will forgive me. Christians are commanded to forgive me, so they have no choice. And everything will be okay after that, and I still get the money. People think that way, honestly. I've sat there with people at CCF where quite literally I have told them what God has told them to do. You know what their response is? I need to pray about it. 
I'm like, why? Well, I, I need to pray about it. I said, what's the point? You think God's going to change? Do you think God's word is going to somehow change while you're out there praying about it? There is nothing to pray about. You are in sin. You need to deal with it. And you need to deal with it right now. But they still, oh no, I need to pray about it. <laughs> Friends, what's your price? Do you have a price? Maybe companionship? I've known many, many lovely young women over the years, and it is normally the girls, not the guys. I've known many young girls who love the Lord. They had such a bright future. God was using them in many ways. And the whole thing got shot to pieces because they fell for the wrong guy. Companionship. It can destroy a life. Money. Many a Christian has sold their testimony for money. Career. Property. Fame. Education. Friends, what's your price? What would it take you to betray or what would it take you for you to betray the Lord of glory, the Savior of your soul? What is your price? I hope you don't have one. I can tell you right now, you could offer to write me a check for $10 million. I'll tear it up and throw it in your face. Right now. Money doesn't interest me at all. I love my God. He gave His Son for me. He saved me. And it's interesting... That when you look at these things, and you look at salvation in the Bible, the Bible uses financial terms to talk about salvation. Did you know that? It uses terms like debt. It uses terms like slaves. It uses terminology like ransom, which was the price that was paid to redeem a slave out of the market pace of sin. When regards to our salvation, the Bible uses financial terms. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life a ransom, a payment for many. Therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said what? It is finished. Do you know what that is? Tetelestai, paid in full. What a lot of people don't realize is that their financial concerns, however big they may be, are not your biggest problem. Your financial concerns are secondary to the condition of your soul and your eternal future. And ultimately, you need to understand that we are in debt to a holy God. And He is angry about our sin. And ultimately, He will collect from each one of us what He is due. Unless Jesus has settled that debt for you. Jesus has settled the debt of everyone that is willing to recognize their need, place all their trust in who he is, that's his person, and what he has done, that is his work. And if you are willing to bow your knee before Jesus Christ and worship him as God this morning and commit your life to him as his disciple, God will cancel your debt. The greatest debt you owe. Romans 10.9 says, If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, in other words, if you recognize his person, if you recognize that Jesus is in fact God and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, that's his work on the cross, you will be saved. That is a promise. That is a guarantee that God has made to each and every one of us. Many of us here have accepted that and our debt has been wiped away. Some of you maybe have yet to do that. So while you may be concerned about your finances, let me assure you, a far greater concern is your eternal future and the condition of your soul before God. Let's pray, shall we? Father, we just want to thank you for all we've learned this morning. Uh, such a lot of information, I know, so many verses, and I pray, Lord, that you would put your finger uh, by the power of your Holy Spirit upon the, the things that matter to each and every individual person, that you would meet them where they're at, and that you would be their teacher. And Lord, if there are things that need to be changed, I pray that you would give them the courage to change them. If there are things that need to be stopped, I pray you would give them the courage to stop them. And if there are practices they need to start, I pray that you would give them the courage to start them. And Lord, if there is anyone here who doesn't, let know, 
doesn't know you yet. If there's anyone here who, who has yet to put their trust in you and uh, has, ba- has yet to bow their knee before you and worship you for who you truly are, then I pray, Lord, that you would give them the courage to, to go to the connect room after and that they would talk to the people there and uh, be willing to discuss this with them. So, Father, we are so grateful for all that you have given us in your word. We know that you are a good God, you are a loving God, and that you desire to bless us in many ways. But ultimately, Lord, you expect us to be faithful servants as well. You expect us to walk with you, to seek your kingdom and your righteousness first. And, Lord, I pray that each and every one of us would seek to do just that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.